Well, Ruthie, thank you enormously. It's great fun to see you, Ruthie, and to see Al, and to get to think about one of my oldest Aspen friends, Simi Hamilton, uh, off in Oberstdorf skiing the sprints tomorrow. So that's good. Um, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Look, Auden asked me to come out, and I do almost anything for Auden. You guys know him as a kind of local hero who gets an awful lot done here. But you need to know that he has played a big, big role nationally, too, in helping take this debate about climate and bring corporate America and the outdoor industry and everything else right square into it. So uh, he's, he, he really is a, a hero. And, and he and his crew, uh, Han and others, were so grateful for the, um, uh, my wife Sue and daughter Sophie and, and son-in-law almost, Josh, uh, we, we, we all came out and we're all, uh, we, we've been, um, indeed, uh, uh, Sue and I have been learning to ski uh, uh, thanks to uh, Jen Gibbons and, and Eric DeRosa, who've somehow been uh, managing to get us down the slope. We, we're, we're both uh, diehard cross-country skiers uh, and, and uh, uh, it's, you know, so we've always enjoyed the fact that um, friction disappears come winter, but now we sort of discover that, you know, thanks to the chairlift and things, gravity can be made to disappear too, you know, and it, it, it's really quite remarkable. Um, uh, we're also really grateful to the nice people here at the Limelight, to Henning and his crew who've been taking good care. Um, um, I'm not going to spend, I really only want to talk for a little while and then just sort of have conversation. And I'm not going to spend much time at all bringing you up to date on where we are <clears throat> scientifically and sort of what the latest is. I'm working on the assumption um, based on all the times and come to Aspen, the people I know, that you all understand what's happening with the climate crisis more or less. Um, um, I'll just say, uh, you know, I, I wrote the first book about it all 31 years ago in 1989, a book called The End of Nature. And at the time, you know, we, we were in the business of issuing warnings. We knew what was coming. We knew what happens when you burn coal and gas and oil, you put carbon in the atmosphere. We knew that it's molecular structure trapped heat. The only thing we didn't know three decades ago was how fast and how hard it would pinch. And it turns out it's pinched harder and faster than, than e even we feared. Um, climate change is the biggest thing that human beings have ever done by <clears throat> orders of magnitude. We've managed so far to raise the temperature of the Earth about a degree Celsius, which is, uh, you know, doesn't sound like an unbelievable amount, but if you take use other units, you get some sense of the heat. The extra heat that we trap near the planet every day because of the CO2 we've emitted into the atmosphere is roughly the heat equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima-sized explosions, okay? So that's enough, that gives you some sense day after day of that to understand how it is that we've melted something like 70% of the sea ice in the summer Arctic, you know? Uh, how it is that we've managed to raise the temperature of the ocean so dramatically and even more dramatically than we've raised the temperature of the land surface. And with it produce already at one degree Celsius an enormous, enormous cascading series of, of really dramatic changes. And now you can, you know, you don't need people writing books. You just can turn on the news any day and watch what's happening. You all saw the pictures over the last four or five weeks from Australia, um, from a place uh, that has endured deeper droughts and higher temperatures than at any point in its history. There was a day in December when the average high temperature averaged for the entire continent of Australia was 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, um, there'd never been anything close to that before, and that explains why it got so incredibly dry and why so much of it went up in smoke. And of course, when it did go up in smoke, it put an enormous plume of carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, Australia's produced far more carbon now in the last few months by burning all those 
forests than it produces in the course of a year, you know, of people running factories and driving cars and whatever. Uh, the, the, the readings that we take at Mauna Loa for the CO2 level in the atmosphere hit a new record high yesterday at about 415 parts per million. And, and some fraction of this year's large increase is clearly coming from that combustion of those forests. Um, in a sense, Australia is the exception to the rule in that uh, the people who are suffering there right now are relatively affluent and have put a huge amount of carbon into the atmosphere already like all of us. For the most part, the iron law of climate change is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and the harder you suffer. And I was reminded of that today when I saw news from uh, a country that I really like and, and, and where there are people that I really admire and work closely with, a country called the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. The Marshall Islands people have been happily hanging out for several thousand years. Everything went well. The 20th century, not so good. We blew up a large portion of it at Bikini Atoll. There's still big parts that are uninhabitable. But uh, the 21st century, much tougher. The highest point in the Marshall Islands is a meter above sea level. That's a bad place to be on a rapidly warming planet. Today, they announced that they were having their first outbreak of a disease called dengue fever. Um, uh, which is the fastest spreading disease on Earth, even if it's not as uh, quite as dramatic as the coronavirus in China. Around the world, dengue, uh, mosquito-borne disease, which the World Health Organization says is the emergent disease of this century, precisely because it so rapidly responds to increase the mosquitoes increase their range in response to increases in temperature and humidity. Well, I mean, nobody in the Marshall Islands caused the problem that they're facing any more than people in Bangladesh uh, or, or uh, the Mekong Delta or a thousand other places around the world that we could name. Um, the scary part of where we are is that one degree is just the beginning. Even if we kept the promises that all the countries in the world made at Paris, the temperature of the planet would still have gone up, would still go up about three degrees or maybe a little bit more Celsius. Uh, five, six, seven degrees Fahrenheit. If that happens, we can't have civilizations like the ones we're used to having. That's more stress than we're able to tolerate. Um, um, just to give one small example, you've, you've watched what happened to the politics of Western Europe when a million refugees arrived from the Middle East. Many of them from Syria, at least at some level, climate refugees because the deepest drought in the history of what we used to call the Fertile Crescent helped kick off the revolution, the civil war that led to that exodus. At any rate, a million of them was enough to fry the politics of Western Europe, just like a million people arriving on our southern border has helped to fry the politics of the United States. Many of those people are climate refugees as well. Uh, if you look at a map, Honduras and Guatemala are f fairly rare on our planet in having big oceans on both sides of them. <coughs> The rapid heating of those oceans, much faster than on land, has led to terrific drought and driven hundreds of thousands of people off farms that no longer can produce food. At any rate, the UN estimates that if we let the temperature keep rising, if we let it go up three degrees, we're likely to see high end a billion climate refugees this century. So multiply the chaos caused by a million climate refugees by a thousand times and try to imagine what that world looks like. If nothing else, it's clear that we need some policy beyond walls and cages, some new ethic of human solidarity emerging. Um, um, because as I say, these people didn't cause the problem from which they're suffering. But it's clear that the biggest single challenge right now is to try and limit the amount of ultimate warming. We've already raised the temperature one degree. Even if we do everything right at this point, it's going to go up probably close to two degrees. But, and it's going to be cause a lot more damage than we've seen already. But it is the cause of our time to figure out how to hold that number as low as we can. And of course, 
though it's not, you know, a traumatic and uh, 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 horrible outcome in quite the same way that dengue fever or having to leave your home or something is, there's also just all the changes for those of us who really do, um, well, who love winter. Um, um, it's remarkable to be here and to see how beautiful winter is here and to be reminded of what a grace it is to have six months or four months or whatever it is every year when friction does kind of disappear and, and the pleasure that that can provide and to realize that we may be among the last generations that get that pleasure. Um, it's remarkably clear that one of the things that's happening is winters are becoming shorter on average and hotter and rainier. And so if nothing else, you take nothing else from this talk tonight, um, take full advantage of every snowstorm that comes um, 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 because there's no guarantee that they're going to keep coming in the same way that we, and that kind of psychological that kind of inability to kind of um, count on the future, in a sense, is one of the biggest and most unsettling things about what we're doing. Um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking about bad things now for a while. Um, um, you all know what's going on. You know how serious it is. You know where we stand. So let's talk about what we indeed might be able to do about it at this point. Um, so the first set of things that always comes to mind that we should do about things are, of course, to make kind of changes in our individual and corporate lives so that we produce less carbon. And that's what everybody's worked on for a long time. And I have no doubt that there are all sorts of people in this room who have worked incredibly hard at that and whose houses are showpieces of what can be done and whose lives have changed in all kinds of ways and who provide. And that is really important work that needs to keep on going as best we can. And it's also important to realize at this point that by itself, it cannot come close to dealing with the problem that we have. Um, climate change is a math problem at its ultimate root, okay? How much carbon is going to end up in the atmosphere, how fast? And the most important part of that math problem is that it comes with a time limit. Unlike other problems that we face, climate change is time limited. We've really never quite I mean, think of the other things in our political lives, say, that, that problems that we face. Like right now, the Trump administration, among its long list of bad things that it's doing, is trying to screw up health care for people and trying to undermine the Affordable Care Act. And, and so that means that there are people getting sick and dying and going bankrupt and on and on and on, and it's terrible. And we should be doing things about it, and I very much hope we will. The only silver lining is that it won't be harder to do the right thing four years from now or eight years from now or tw whenever it is. It won't, be, won't have been made more difficult by what we're not doing now, okay? Climate change isn't like that. If we don't solve it soon, then the next generation of people will not have a chance to solve it because we will have passed the series of physical tipping points beyond which there is no way back. We've already passed some of them. Nobody has a plan for refreezing the Arctic now, okay? And, and we're close on others. In December, the world's leading uh, Earth system scientists put out a paper in Nature saying that of the major 11 tipping points they could identify around the world, we were right up to the edge or over it on nine of them. Um, um, these are things like Arctic ice, like the circulation of currents in the ocean, like uh, uh, the transition of the Amazon rainforest uh, towards a savanna, on and on and on. Uh, we're right up against those things, and if we don't solve them soon, we won't solve them. So you can't make that math work one Prius at a time, okay? One vegan dinner at a time. It's really good and important to do those things, 
but don't count on them as the main way that we're going to get ourselves out of the box that we've gotten into. There are instead the need for individuals, uh, maybe the way to say this is, at the moment, probably the most important thing an individual can do is not be so much of an individual. It's joined together with others in movements big enough to do the job of rewriting the basic political and economic ground rules. And if we can do that at speed, then we have some chance. Now, that movement building is sort of what I've been about for the last 10 or 12 years. It's not what I, I mean, it took me way too long to figure out that that's what we needed to do. I spent the first 10 or 15 years after I'd written The End of Nature operating in the assumption that probably I should write more books because what we needed was more data and so we should have more conferences and symposiums and journal articles because I thought we were in an argument and that eventually we would pile up enough data and at that point our leaders would have no choice but to do the right thing. That was a fundamental misinterpretation. We had won the argument long ago. By the mid-1990s, the world scientists were in robust consensus about what was going on. Okay? We'd won the argument. We were just losing the fight because the fight wasn't about data and reason and evidence. The fight was what fights are always about, money and power. And the other side, mostly the fossil fuel industry, had so much money and hence so much power that they were able to keep winning the fight even as they lost the argument. It was clear that we weren't going to be able to outspend them, um, you know, um, 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 even in a room in Aspen. I think it's probably clear that we could pool our resources and still come up somewhat short of Exxon, you know. Um, um, but there are points in history when people have shown that they can band together in numbers large enough and savvy enough to, uh, uh, well, to make real change. If there, was, if there were two great inventions of the 20th century, one was the solar panel. And the fact that the engineers have now dropped the price of that to the point where it's the cheapest way on earth to produce power is one of the things that gives us great hope. And the other great invention of the 20th century was the nonviolent social movement. All the work that people like the suffragists and Gandhi and Dr. King and others did to figure out how you could build movements that would allow the small and the many to take on the mighty and the few, that's the thing that gives us hope. So about 10 years ago, we started trying to build movements. 350.org was sort of the first iteration of a kind of climate movement. And I'm so grateful to see all the 350 crew from the Roaring Fork here tonight. And, and so many thanks for that. And, and, and you know, we've, we've organized, we think, about 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth except North Korea and built out, you know, the fight around the Keystone Pipeline, which then became the sort of fight about fossil fuel infrastructure everywhere and so on and so forth. Um, and now there are so many other great examples of this kind of movement building all emerging and all coalescing and working together. So we've seen in the last few years uh, the rise of the Sunrise Movement, a group that I love. Um, I've known almost you know, all their leaders for many years because they all cut their teeth on the campus divestment fight, uh, uh, which I, I worked hard on. And these, these are the people who were responsible for the Green New Deal and working with uh, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez to bring power to that. They're remarkable. We see the rise of Extinction Rebellion, uh, first in Europe and now across the pond here, uh, 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 bringing creative energy to this work. We see the remarkable rise of, of in the last 18 months of, I mean, if you ever wanted, um, you know, sort of proof of the Holy Spirit or whatever, to watch uh, uh, Greta Thunberg uh, go from being one 15-year-old schoolgirl sitting in on the steps of the Swedish parliament to a movement, but by September we were able that we had seven million people in the streets in these climate strikes all over the planet. Um, it just, 
fantastic. And she is great. It's been great fun getting to know her and work with her. But the really good news is there are 10,000 Gretas all over the planet, young people from every continent. And they're standing up and doing this work and joining in this kind of burgeoning movement. Um, it's a movement that draws heavily on the frontline communities that are most vulnerable to climate change. It's led in many cases by indigenous communities on this continent and other continents. And that's really powerful. It's really good to see the, the kind of meshing up of the most ancient wisdom traditions on this planet with the newest wisdom traditions on the planet. The view from the sweat lodge and the view from the kind of supercomputer and the satellite are very much in sync now, I think. And what they're telling us is that the conventional wisdom that most of us have lived our lives under, that our economies are always going to keep growing and so on and so forth, are somewhat nonsensical at this point. That's a powerful place. We've got this movement growing now. And the polling, even in America, which is the most you know, backward of countries on climate change, it indicates that something like 70% of Americans now understand at some level the problem, if not always the dire urgency of it, okay? That's good. It's hard to get Americans, 70% of Americans to agree on anything at all anymore, okay? So that's powerful. There are, I think at the moment, way more people who want to do something about climate change who are scared about it and want to do something serious about it, then there are things for them to do, or at least things that they perceive as they, ways that they could act. I wager that there are people in this room tonight who think to themselves, I would really, really like to be able to do something that changes the outcome of this, that has some real leverage and effect, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. So I'm gonna make just a couple of suggestions about what those things might be. I'm gonna operate on the theory that there are basically two power centers on our planet. And one of them, the first one is politics and government. And obviously this is an incredibly important year uh, for politics and government in our country. It's an, you know, it's an even numbered year and that means that there are going to be elections, and nobody needs to have me explain why the presidential election this year may be the most uh, significant that we've almost ever had. Not only most significant, but there's lots and lots of reason to think that it could end up producing all kinds of interesting change. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked hard four years ago for my fellow Vermonter, Mr. Sanders, and he um, put me on the one of the 15 people writing the Democratic platform last time around. So we worked hard to make that platform a progressive document. And on climate change, it really was pretty progressive. But I will tell you now that every single person running for president um, uh, on the Democratic side this time is way to the left of where that platform was four years ago including Joe Biden just down the line, okay? That's because the public conversation has moved so far. Uh, it was, you know, really what, uh, if Bernie, maybe the first thing that he accomplished was helping begin that shift, and now everybody is there. And it's powerful to see what some of the depth of some of their plans uh, to watch Elizabeth Warren explain that in her administration, the very first thing that'll happen on the very first day is an end to mining and drilling and fracking on public lands across America. That's very powerful. Public lands across America taken, you know, BLM land and Forest Service land, if they were a country on their own, they'd be the fifth biggest source of carbon in the world, okay? So this was something that a president could do day one that would have enormous impact. To listen to, uh, uh, um, well, just to listen to all of them talk is really important. And it means that, that, that we have an opportunity come election time to get some things done. We'll see. Um, and, and I, you know, um, it's not just at the federal level. We need to work state by state and city by city as well. And Colorado is one of those places that should be doing more than it is. 
Colorado, like Vermont, where I come from, is, has a tremendously green reputation, but actually maybe doesn't punch quite as much, you know, it sort of punches a little below its weight in certain ways, okay? It's really important to end fracking in this state, uh, or at least to pass the laws that people were talking about to, to, if nothing else, set it back so that they're not fracking in people's backyards and schoolyards and wherever else. Um, I, it was really powerful to watch 38 activists get arrested at the Colorado State House a couple of weeks ago. I think a couple of them uh, are and will. Others are here right now. Thank you for that witness and, and for that work. And the good news, I think, is that the charges have been dropped, yes? So you'll be out walking uh, 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 more work. Um, 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 there's, you know, there's lots of things that should be happening here. Colorado should be declaring a climate emergency, just the way that the UK and now a half dozen other countries around the world have done. Um, um, committing to phasing out both fossil fuel use and production on some kind of aggressive timetable. I know that there's a big fight right now to end fracking at this uh, site in near Fort Collins. Bella Romero, is that what it's called? Um, these are really important steps around which to mobilize. So I don't think there's any need really to bring people's attention more to the political frame right now. If you're not, if you're not engaged by politics in 2020 in the United States, then nothing will ever engage you in our political <laughs> life, okay? So I'm gonna not talk about that more I'm going to talk about and finish this talk just by talking about the other lever of power in the world, not entirely disconnected, but distinct, and that's the lever of financial power, okay? Um, eight years ago, uh, working with uh, my friend and colleague Naomi Klein, we proposed this divestment movement uh, uh, modeled on the one that a quarter century, really 40 years ago now, helped bring down apartheid in South Africa. And we started asking with 350, we started asking colleges and churches and other people to sell their stock in coal and gas and oil on the theory that this might, um, well, there, our, our original hope was merely that it would kind of begin to rob this industry of its sort of social license to operate, that it would begin to cause people to question more closely this industry and to understand, if nothing else, the basic math about climate change that in their reserves of the coal, big coal, gas, and oil companies on Earth is five times more carbon than we could burn and have any hope at meeting the climate targets we set at Paris. That is to say, if those companies follow the business plans that they have laid out, told their shareholders and their bankers that they're planning on doing, then there's no mystery to this story. It ends in utter tragedy. Sorry. So that, that campaign began very small. The first, the very first institution to divest on Earth was a little tiny college in rural Maine called Unity College, and it divested its $8 million endowment, and we had an enormous celebration that day, and it was really powerful. Thanks to many of the people in this room and campaigners all over the world, last month we went past the $12 trillion mark in endowments and portfolios that have divested in part or in whole from fossil fuel. It's become the biggest anti-corporate <laughs> campaign in history. I was really glad to meet someone here today from Pitzer College who worked hard to divest that college years ago. And, and they've, you know, they're now uh, uh, hundreds of colleges, half the colleges and universities in the UK. The University of California system in November divested its $80 billion endowment and pension fund. The city of New York invest, divested its $200 billion pension fund. The next day the city of London did the same thing and now the mayors of those cities have challenged all the other big cities on earth to follow suit. This has become an enormous movement and it's had very real effect, more than we anticipated. Uh, when Peabody Coal went bankrupt, they had to list the set of reasons why they 
were no longer able to meet their obligations. And one of them was this divestment movement had starved them of the ability to raise capital. Shell Oil last year in its annual report said divestment had become a material risk to its business, which is good news because Shell Oil's business is a material risk to the planet, okay? So this is the work that you have done on this is paying off and it continues to expand all the time. Um, um, we've had in the last year, you know, the, the entire country of Ireland divested all its public holdings from fossil fuel. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the biggest single pool of investment capital on earth, a trillion dollars, most of it made from North Sea oil, divested from fossil fuel. Now even some big companies, insurance companies in Europe and things, have begun divesting. It's been remarkable to watch. But, but, we're up against this clock. Time is the real enemy here. I mean, and when I say time is the enemy, I mean we're not talking like we have decades to spare. We have years to spare. When the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in fall of 2018 put out their most recent report, they said that if we wanted to reach the targets we set in Paris, then we had to have a fundamental transformation of energy systems by 2030, which they defined as having the amount of carbon being produced. By 2030, which is now less than a decade away. That's the kind of time that we have. And that's why we have to ramp up this fight. Yeah, we've done damage to Shell and Exxon and others, but they're not ever going to just give up the game and go away because they don't know how to do anything else. I mean, Exxon will fight to the last bridge because the only thing on earth they know how to do is dig stuff up and burn it, okay? And so we have to figure out some ways to expand this to other targets as well. And that's been the work of the last year. Increasingly, increasingly, we're going at the big financial institutions that make it possible for the fossil fuel industry to go on expanding. That's, that money pipeline may turn out to be the single most important pipeline on earth, and it is enormous, enormous. So I'll give you one example of one of the companies that we're working hard on. J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest bank in the country, um, is also the biggest lender to the fossil fuel industry. They've lent $196 billion to the fossil fuel industry in the last three years. That is, since the Paris Climate Accords, they increased the amount that they were lending. And they've lent for every single one of the worst ideas that you've ever heard about. Tar sands up in Canada, deep sea, ultra deep sea drilling, going into the Arctic, building, if you have a bad idea, that will destroy the planet, you definitely should t run it by J.P. Morgan Chase because they'll probably give you some money in order to do it. <laughs> so people have begun to try and take these guys on. The campaigns have developed over the last year or so against these biggest banks, against the big asset managers like BlackRock, and against the big insurance companies. Uh, the asset managers like BlackRock own immense amounts of stock. BlackRock owns more coal and oil and gas than anybody in the whole world because of the size of their holdings. The insurance companies are a particularly vexing example of, of sort of human cussedness. These are the guys who we ask to analyze risk in our society, and they have all the data to demonstrate precisely what's going on. That's what they collect. That's how they decide how much they're going to charge you for premiums. That's how they know to stop writing, as they've done in the last few years, refuse to write insurance policies for people living too near the seacoast or people living in California where they fear that their houses will burn or whatever. They've, they've revoked you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of policies. But what they haven't done is A, stop investing huge sums of money in the fossil fuel industry, and B, stop insuring the new projects, the pipelines, the frac... You can't go build a pipeline unless you can get someone to write insurance for you. That's how 
business works in this world. And all they would have to do is put aside this relatively small portion of their business. So that's what people have been asking. And here's the good news. Those first demands have begun to really meet with some progress. Across Europe, banks and insurance companies have largely now backed out of financing coal, and they're beginning to move on tar sands oil and things like that. In this country, even, even in this country, the same thing is starting to happen. We were, everybody was working hard on Liberty Mutual because it was the kind of, uh, uh, the best example of this kind of uh, uh, flagrant um, um, hypocrisy by the insurance industry. And after a bunch of demonstrations and things in December, they came out with the beginnings of a, well, it's not a perfect policy by any means, but it's a big step. You probably saw the news that uh, BlackRock uh, last month, the CEO, Larry Fink, produced a really quite remarkable letter uh, announcing that really all of capitalism was going to have to change to deal with the climate crisis, uh, that it was now accelerating at the point where they were going to have to take, we'll see if they mean what they say, um, because words are cheap, but words are the first step here. And that was very, very good news for the people who've been running this campaign against BlackRock. And now as the spring winter turns into spring, we're going to be fighting with a real focus on J.P. Morgan Chase, this battle around trying to get them to stop or to start restricting their lending to the fossil fuel industry, at least to the, the beginning, to the most expansionary projects. And it's going to be a knockdown, I'm afraid, it's going to be a tough fight because, uh, well, because they're one of the richest, they're one of the great central pillars of global capital, so of course they're powerful and it'll be hard, but they also have a huge history in this regard. The lead director at J.P. Morgan Chase, the most important member of the board of directors, is a man named Lee Raymond, who before he retired and went on the Chase board, spent 15 years as the CEO of Exxon, where in essence he helped invent corporate climate denial, you know, as a strategy. So that's why people are beginning to make noise around this stuff, and it's why we need you to help in this. I said before that we're not going to win this thing one vegan dinner at a time, one Tesla at a time, whatever, okay? And I got to tell you that Aspen is probably not going to exercise enough political clout in and of itself to determine who the next president is or what the Senate ends up looking like or so on and so forth. You have to play a part in that, and I'm sure you'll play a big part, but that's, but what does Aspen have? It probably has a higher concentration of what they call high net worth individuals, and in this case they define worth as money, I believe, high net worth individuals <laughs> as any place, any zip code on planet Earth, okay? Um, um, I, and that means that this is a place, and that's really why I told Odd and I'd come out um, um, to talk, um, that means that this is an arena in which the people in this room can make an enormous difference themselves or by talking to their neighbors or their people around them. Look, if 15, 20, 25, 30 really, really big players tell Chase that they don't want to, they're not going to keep their money there anymore, that's the kind of thing that these guys start listening to and start listening to hard. And it's not like it's all that difficult to move your bank account. It's not like it's all that hard to find a new set of credit cards. Most people get, you know, eight letters a week in the mail asking them to take out another credit card, okay? It's not like this is impossible. I'm going to show you, this is the, this is the, we're going to be Sundance for a minute. This is the world premiere of this video that uh, I'm actually not really supposed to show you because it's not going to get released for a few days, but it, it's from events about 10 days ago in um, Washington, D.C. at the Chase Bank. And you've been following this Jane Fonda fire drill Fridays thing that's been going on in Washington where she's, she's been leading these great week after week, these great civil disobedience actions. Well, the last one took place on January 10th. She had to go back. She had to leave 
Washington and go back to California to film the next season of uh, Grace and Frankie, um, um, which I highly recommend. Um, um, and so they were, they were on Capitol Hill as usual, and you'll see them there. And some of the rest of us were a, a, a few blocks away. Let me see if I can get this thing to play here. I probably can't, but I'll, let's see. Hello there. Can we speak to the manager, please? Yes, I'm the manager. Bill McKibben. Nice to meet you. This is Reverend Lennox. Nice to meet you. So we're representing a whole coalition of environmental groups, and Chase is, as you know, the biggest funder of fossil fuels in the country. So we have a letter that we'd like you to send back to New York to Jamie Dimon, and we're just going to wait here and see uh, what kind of answer we get, because we need Chase to stop funding fossil fuels. So we're just going to be hanging out. Right, right. Uh, well, unfortunately, we can't hang out in the bed, but I will take care of this for you. All right, Liz, you probably want to talk about that, and we'll... All right. So we're going to work on Why don't we go, uh, we'll just go sit down over here for a while. I'm going to give you Bill McKibben, who is currently occupying the Chase Bank. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me there? Greetings from uh, about a half mile away. There's about 25 of us inside the Chase Bank branch. And this really marks the launch of this Stop the Money Pipeline campaign. Beginning what's going to be hundreds thousands of demonstrations like the ones that are happening today. Massive civil disobedience, massive unrest about the financial system. We are so happy to be with you all. Uh, the police have just arrived here and we want to send a big message out from here, everybody. So here's the deal. I mean, this is this this feels to me like the 
way it felt at the launch of the fight against the Keystone Pipeline eight years ago or the start of the divestment movement. This is one of the next great moments in this climate fight, and we need you all in it. Environmental groups happily are coming together to do this together. That was Annie Leonard uh, uh, speaking there outside the bank. She runs Greenpeace in the U.S. The Sierra Club has been playing a huge part in this. The Rainforest Action Network, Extinction Rebellion. We're working hard with all the young people at Fridays for the Future uh, 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 and so on. And the day that you need to circle on your calendar is April the 23rd. April 22nd, as you know, is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Okay? And so the young people working with Dennis Hayes, the guy who put together the first Earth Day 50 years ago, has been working hard with all the young, all the sort of uh, American versions of Greta. Uh, and they've been putting together a plan for three days of action beginning on the 22nd, a Wednesday, going to the 23rd and the 24th. And the 23rd, that Thursday, is the day for action on finance. There are 5,200 Chase Bank branches around the country, and we hope to have people outside or inside or whatever is almost all of them, okay? Um, not everywhere are people going to do, probably be able to do civil disobedience because there's places where it's, it'll be too hard or there's, the penalties are too high or whatever it is. But that's what's going to be going on a lot of places. Other places people will be doing informational pickets or teach-ins or whatever it is. Um, that's some of the work that we need you all engaged in. We need you, because it's a way, it's not that we're going to shut down Chase Bank by going in their lobby for a day. That's obviously not going to happen. What we're going to do is use it as a way to explain to as much of the country as possible what their role is and put pressure on them to change, okay? And if they change, the reason that this is for me so important and so exciting is if they change, one, it will happen fast. Change will come quickly. If Chase said tomorrow, we're no longer going to lend to expansionary fossil fuel projects, okay? The results would be, the result in the stock market would happen within minutes or hours, okay? That, that's not the speed at which our political systems move, okay? This moves fast and it moves globally. Money is the one global language, okay? And so that's the place where Wall Street and Aspen and Seattle and Silicon Valley and a few other places have enormous power to move not only our country, but every other country around the world as well. That's why we're asking you to join in this new fight and join in in as many creative and, 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 and beautiful ways as you can figure out to do. You can tell from watching that video, there's always something awkward about standing up Going into, some, I mean, I, I hate, I mean, you watch me like go into that bank. It's like the most awkward thing in the world, okay? I mean, and especially for me, I'm, a, I'm not an extrovert or organizer or anything by, by temperament. I'm a writer. It's nice to be with you all. I'd really rather be home in my room typing, okay? Um, so it's hard to, it's a little awkward to do any of this. The only thing I can tell you is the planet is a mile outside its comfort zone, so the rest of us better figure out how to get outside ours and fast. Thank you. I know that the, the X Games are underway, and you may need to go out and see what, you know, what, how many spins people are able to be <laughs> producing, many more than I can. So it's completely fine to leave. But if you want to uh, hang around for a minute, uh, I mean, this is uh, questions, comments, or abuse are all fine. Uh, uh, Auden was right. This should be a, 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 as rowdy as you would like it to be. And uh, Auden, is there a microphone that we should be handing to people to talk or just? Just shout, and I'll repeat if you can't hear it. Stand up, Brett. Yeah, you stand up and stand up and. He runs three fifty.
My name is Fred Baylow, and I'm a volunteer for 350. I know just who you are. Thank you for your work. You bet. Uh, the issue I have with 350, the issue I have with 350 and all the climate organizations is that they are so supply focused. Everything is uh, uh, leave it in the ground, ban fracking, and that reminds me of the war on drugs where they focused on shutting down the pushers, the Medellin cartel, and the Sinopia cartel, and they didn't do anything about the, uh, the uh, demand. And I just wonder if we are really ever going to be able to do anything about the, uh, eliminating fossil fuels unless we eliminate the demand for fossil fuels. So it's get the uh, fossil fuel burners off the road uh, have the power companies switch to renewables, and that, that would be the key to our success. So this is a really important question. And here's, the, I mean, here's, how, here's how it appears to me as I watch this story that's developing. The engineers have done a tremendous service, right? In the last decade, they've dropped the price of solar power and wind power about 90%. That means that we're now at a point where if we wanted to move, we could. Okay, uh, we could make huge change quickly, uh, and there's just enough examples around the world to kind of prove it of countries that have done or regions that have done it with real speed. Um, but and eventually we will do it. Okay, 75 years from now, the planet's gonna run on sun and wind because it's essentially free. All right. The problem is that at the pace at which we're currently making this transition, the world that runs on sun and wind in 75 years is going to be a fundamentally broken world. So our job is to figure out how to speed up that transition, how to make it work harder. Now, there are ways that you can do that, by, and people have and should continue to focus on demand side. And it's one of the reasons that it's so important that things like the Green New Deal talk hard about uh, you know, 50% uh, uh, reduction in fossil fuel use or 70% or whatever it is by this date and that date and whatever. Those are important targets to try and meet. It's also important to try and break the political power of the fossil fuel industry because that's what keeps us from actually adopting across the country and the world those targets and moving in that direction. Their calculation is they know that, I mean, they know they're going to be 75 years from now that they're going to be out of business. They want to maintain their business model another decade or two. That's what they're fighting for. That's how far into the future business looks anymore, really, in our society. So that's why the fight has become so fundamental about these companies. It's not just their plans. Those are very important and the amount of money they're pouring into expanding the fossil fuel industry. It's that also those same companies are the ones that make it so politically difficult. Think about what happened in Colorado. People put on the ballot a completely common sense, seems to me, measure to say we won't frack within what was the distance? Thousand. Thousand. Yeah. So you can't frack right next to somebody's house, school, whatever. It seems sensible. I remember coming to Denver to I help raise money for the people who were, and in the course of an evening, we raised, uh, I think in one evening at the house in Denver with a lot, we raised uh, about a half million dollars, which turned out to be about half, I think, of the money that got spent in favor of that campaign. The fossil fuel industry, put in $50 million, okay? They put in more money than has ever been spent on any ballot measure in Colorado's history. I remember driving around, Den I remember being driving through Denver and there were trucks driving up and down the highway that weren't carrying, they just were towing billboards behind the trucks saying vote against this you know, proposition because they'd run out of TV ads to buy and radio spots to buy whatever else. That's why it got beaten in the end and not by very much, okay? Same thing happened with the plan the same day with the plan for a serious carbon tax in the state of Washington. It was way ahead in the polls, just like that thing in Colorado had been, but the fossil fuel industry poured in 40 million. We've got to figure out how to break some of their power. 
And an important way to do that is to raise the cost of their capital, to make it hard for them to be able to fund the kinds of things that they want to do. That's what the Chase banks of the world do. They just keep supplying these guys and prolonging. And when they put some new piece of infrastructure in place, what that means is not that we're not just that it's a problem right then, it means that it's a problem for the next 40 years because that's how long a pipeline lasts or a LNG terminal lasts or whatever it is. Once it's in place, it's really hard to pull it out. So that's why we fight them hard. Thank you so much for your work on all this stuff. Uh, hi, Bill. Uh, I traveled 70 miles to get here. I'm hoping you'll give me 70 seconds. Uh, gracias for your work. My family and I marched with you in New York City, Denver, Nebraska, and D.C. Today we're here in Aspen, a, a town known for consumption, not conservation, at an event sponsored by the Aspen Skiing Company. Aspen Skiing Company support, uh, supports expanding the runway at the airport so more private jets can land. Private jets are at least eight times less efficient than commercial jets. They refuse to stop selling meat and dairy. Meat and dairy creates more emissions than all tailpipe emissions in one. They create tons of trash each year, of which less than 8% is recyclable. Aspen Skiing Company <laughs> is wholly owned and operated by the Crown family. The Crown family has a significant stake in J.P. Morgan Chase and General Dynamics. General Dynamics is a global defense company that makes combat vehicles used in wars fought over oil. J.P. Morgan Chase is involved in oil field exploration. So here's my question. How do you justify tying your name to a company whose best efforts to combat climate change amount to greenwashing, who supports endless wars, wars fought over oil, and oil exploration? Well. So, I, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm not an employee of Aspen Skiing Company. I can hardly ski, as it turns out. Um, but I think that this is sort of what I was talking about. You could shut down Aspen Skiing Company tomorrow, which it sounds like you might like to do. And in fact, none of the things that we're facing would materially change, OK? That the, the arc of where we're going would continue. So what one looks for, I guess what I, let, let me answer, you ask questions, let me answer it. What one looks for are points of maximum leverage. We have a decade to solve the problem that we face. So one tries to figure, and so I don't, my guess is that the meat and dairy that's served by Aspen Seen Company is not going to be the maximum point of leverage or- the, the money that they make selling meat and dairy. So, so why, that's exactly why I'm talking about J.P. Morgan Chase. Pointing the fingers at them. That's why I'm here because we're talking about because we're talking about the people in this town, and I do the same. You're you you got no. I I, I disagree with you. I think that the what we need to do is build the fight against the biggest players in the world, like J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'd be very happy if people like the Aspen Skiing Company were able to leverage their leadership to begin putting pressure on Chase. That would be a good thing. That's a powerful step. But, but, I, think that you, um, but I think that you probably reduce some of the power of that appeal with the kind of, uh, the kind of one of the things that, that I think environmentalists should be careful about is a kind of constant attempt at sort of purity tests for everybody. And because and I, I don't think, it, in my experience, it just doesn't prove to be particularly productive. Um, the, and the sort of, the, I mean, so, so to use the example you were using of sort of meat and dairy, whatever. It's a very good idea to eat much lower on the food chain, okay? And people should do it. A very good idea to eat much lower on the food chain, and people should do it. But look around. I mean, I spend a lot of time out 
in the, in the larger world, okay? They're huge parts of the planet that are just coming into the kind of meat-eating part of their existence. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people who really like it. I remember being, an example. I remember, so, so let me, you, you were, you started, let me just finish. Bombs, man. Let me just finish. I'm, I'm against. I'm against bombing. Okay, so let's. We, we're in robust, robust and profound agreement upon it. Let me just go back to this example because I'm trying to make a point. I remember once being, in, I remember once being in Beijing. Okay, on the in a slum on what was then the outskirts of Beijing. This was five years ago, so now it's in the center of Beijing because they've built three more sort of rings around it. But it was a pretty poor part of town. And I was talking with the guy in the slum. I said, why did you, move? an old guy, I said, why did you move from your village to town? And he looked at me and he said, he said oh, he said, in my village, there was no meat and no alcohol. <laughs> I was like, okay, I, I, you know, it really brought home to me how difficult it is going to be to do this one person at a time around the world, okay? One, and so, yeah, it's, you know, stand at the top of the ski lift with the thing telling people not to, you know, to, to buy the vegetarian option at lunch, whatever. It's good, I'm for you, uh, you know, I, I like it, but I, if one's looking for leverage to change things in the time that we have, look for as much leverage as possible. For me, Right now, that's J.P. Morgan Chase, it's BlackRock, it's a few places like that, and that's why I'm here, because there is a lot of money and influence in this place, and we'd like it used in the right direction. So, there we are. that I'd like to know, and I'm not from Aspen either, a lot of friends here, but uh, how can we vote against our pocketbook in the next election? I see this as the biggest problem. Um, it's, it's easier for some of us than others of us, but I think when we look across the whole country, and people might look at, you know, and I don't want to say climate change aside, but I have to say that because people are going to vote their pocketbooks in this next election, and some of us will be more impacted than others by that. And that, like, I see J.P. Morgan as part of that. I think that's very interesting looking at, you know, Chase. As in, I mean, we both just went, oh, my God, we have Chase credit cards. But, Don't you know, cut them up yet. <laughs> Wait till April 23rd. You know? <laughs> but what are we going to get? What are we going to tell our friends and encourage people all around us not to just go totally radical and crazy and not ever eat meat again? I'm sorry, but people aren't going to do that. But how do we get them to vote their pocketbook in the next election, to vote against their pocketbook in the next election? That's what we have to do. Well, I mean, I actually think that what we want people to do in the next, my guess is that, that, that the right side will win the next election if people actually vote in their own self-interest. I mean, I think the problem is, in fact, in our country that, that an enormous percentage of people have been fooled into voting against their own self-interest. And, and so I think that's you know, an important thing to work on. But I will, I, I will add, because I think it goes to your point, it's not voting is an important thing to do. And, you know, November, whatever it is next year is going to be a super, this year is going to be a super important date. November 3rd? 3rd. 3rd. Um, a super important date. But it's really important to remember that politics doesn't, is not synonymous with elections, okay? So November 4th is a really important day too. I mean, once, we, even if we get the right person, I, I remember telling Bernie, that we, Bernie asked me to come introduce him the day that he announced for president in 2016. So I said, okay, I'll come and give the speech, you know, introduce on the shores of Lake Champlain, introducing you, you know, as you run for president. But you have to understand, um, if you're elected, you know, I'll be down there, you know, six months later, you know, uh, chained to the door of the White House because you're not going fast enough. And he's like, I wouldn't have it any other way. So that, you know, that's why politics doesn't end there. And politics, this is the, so think about that map okay, that, that uh, Trump always shows of the electoral coalition that brought him in power that shows the U.S. is this vast sea of red and he just sort of makes fun of these small blue pockets and whatever, okay. So the reason I'm talking to you guys about finance is if you took a map of money in America, okay, 
The money all exists in those blue pockets, all right? You can't sway the electoral future necessarily. Our constitutional system, our electoral system, is pretty heavily rigged to make it very difficult to, you know, I mean, it favors uh, uh, the, the Trumps of the world. But the money primary, we can win. If you looked at that map, if you examined that map, there'd be a big dot right over Aspen to demonstrate just how much money there was here. So it's possible, I think it's actually probable, that the most important thing that could happen in Aspen and its surroundings is to mobilize around these financial questions because that's where you have outsized power. If we're going to, I mean, look, <coughs> It's a it's it's a um, it's an against the odds game at this point to have to be successful on climate change. I, I'll just say it straight out. I mean, look, chances are we're not going to get done what needs doing, but there's some chance, reasonable chance, that we could, and it relies on figuring out where those leverage and pressure points are and not becoming overly distracted by other things, okay? And that's, if I have any value in this, it's because I've spent 30 years working on this question, so I have a pretty good sense of all the different things and ideas that people have tried and worked, and what have worked and what haven't, and have some sense of where that leverage might lie. And I think this is why, I mean, that's why I'm going back to DC to go stand trial for having done this thing on the bank next month, you know? Um, <laughs> because I thought it was important and, and, and hope that you all can figure out some ways to do the same kind of thing. Um, so my question has to do with um, institutions. We know that institutions, people joining together have a lot of power to make a difference. And yet we're living in a time when it, the individual is most important, especially in America. And so I'm just curious, I mean, a march on Washington, an event at the State House where everybody got arrested last week or whatever that was. Those are great, but we're not coming together as, as truly institutions like the people did in the 50s and 60s. And I'm just curious, do you have a suggestion on how to get people to want to belong and want to join so that we can actually get something done? And not for one-offs, but for long-lasting things. Yep. I mean, look, organizing is, is a hard job. Um, but you shouldn't be completely discouraged by it, you know? One of the things to bear in mind is that you don't need, if you're gonna run, if you're gonna win campaigns like the ones we're talking about, you do not need everybody. You don't even need 51% of people. The political scientists have, who've been studying now nonviolent movements pretty closely are pretty clear that if you can get four or five percent of people engaged in a fight, you almost always win. And the reason for that is apathy cuts both ways, okay? Apathy is a very hard thing to overcome for everyone. So we worked super hard last September to get seven million people in the streets for these climate strikes. It's a ton of work. You gotta make sure that there are enough porta potties. There have to be enough stages and microphones and permits and you know, it is bloody hard work. The one thing that we didn't worry about was that the day afterwards, seven million people would come out in the streets to demand more climate change and back up the fossil fuel industry or whatever. Apathy cuts both ways. So if we're able to get people engaged, then we will win. And the proof of that is what happened on the first Earth Day in this country 50 years ago. There's people in this room who are old enough to, like me to remember that day, okay? Um, 20 million Americans went into the street that day. It, that was one in 10 of the current population in America in 1970. One in 10, it was probably the biggest day of political action in American political history. And it was enough, okay? Even though the president was a right-wing corrupt Republican, Richard Nixon, he had no choice but to sign into law the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, all the acts that Donald Trump is now finally gutting 50 years later. Those happened not because he cared about the environment at all, but because enough people had stood up. 
So we're getting there. We're not there yet. We need more people. We need, an, but we're, that's the movement that we've been trying to build for so long. And it is building now. And one of the ways that you get people engaged in it is to have a fight. That is our nature. So having a fight with Chase Bank is a good idea on all kinds of counts, including the fact that everybody, so many people can get engaged in it. Most people don't have an oil pipeline in their backyard. Most people don't have a coal mine in their backyard. So it doesn't seem exactly real and, and actionable to them. But you know what? Half the people in this room have a Chase credit card in their wallet because Every time, you know, every time Amazon issues a card, it has, comes from Chase Bank. Every time United Airlines issues a card, it comes from Chase Bank. Everybody in here has a stake in that kind of fight and a way to get engaged in it. I think there might even be a Chase branch in this town. It seems to me we walk by it someplace near the weed shop there, you know, whatever. Um, um, so, you know, it's... You all have, you don't have a pipeline right here, but you got a Chase Bank, so, you know, get going. Uh, speaking of politics, is it true that Michael Bloomberg has put half a billion with a B dollars into fighting climate change? Um, the question is, has Michael Bloomberg put big money into fighting climate change? Yes, he put money for many years into this, a half a, I think $50 million into fighting coal plants for a long time which was good. The only problem is we kept shutting down coal plants and they kept building, you know, converting them to natural gas, which turns out to be just as bad as coal in, in climate terms. Now he's put a lot of money into fighting uh, natural gas plants, which is good. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know I, don't have, I don't have the greatest uh, desire to have billionaires sort of uh, run our political life, but it is good when billionaires put up you know, significant sums of money to let campaigners do the things that they need to do. So that was good. Let's do just, I'm sort of beginning to worry about holding you all here, so let's do two or three more here. Um, I work with kids. I'm an environmental educator in this valley, focusing on sustainable agriculture, and I teach kids how to do it. Yes. Kids always not want to know what they can do, and they don't always want to strive yep. because it impacts their school lives yep. so much. What do you say to kids? So the, the, the first thing to say is kids are doing, I mean, kids are run, doing all the, so much of the work in this fight now. And the climate strikes and all the other things they're doing are so great. I, it's very weird for me, I mean, because um, many of my colleagues now are like 12 years old. I, I, wrote, a, uh, I wrote an op-ed piece for the Los Angeles Times last year with a 12-year-old from Denver named Haven Coleman, who does terrific work, and I really like her. I, I spent part of October writing college recommendations for people who I think of as like close colleagues that I work with, okay? And in important, so I think kids are basically doing, and, 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 and pestering their parents is an important part of their organizing work, okay? Kids are doing the work, but, but, and, listen to this, it is not okay to take the biggest problem the world has ever faced and tell high school sophomores that it's their job to deal with it, okay? So it's our job to follow quickly up. And one thing, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. I wrote the first, I wrote the letter asking people to come. Maybe this is, see, I, I really am worried about holding you all here, so we'll end here, okay? I'll, here. Uh, this is uh, the biggest problem. Okay, okay. I, I wrote the letter asking people to come to Washington to get arrested at the start of the Keystone Pipeline thing, which is a hard letter to write, okay? But, but one of the things I said in it was, in this case, I didn't think young people should be the cannon fodder, okay? Because if you're 19, it's probably not the best thing in the world to have an arrest record on your resume. One of the few unmixed blessings of growing older is, past a certain point, what the hell are they going to do to you, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was with real pleasure that I watched people with hairlines like mine descend on DC. Now this was the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in many years. We did not ask people as they were getting arrested, how old are you, you know, because that would be rude, but we did 
cleverly, I think, say, who was president when you were born? Okay? <laughs> and the two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. On the last day, there was a guy arrested with a sign around his neck. It said, World War II vet, handle with care. He was, he was old enough that he'd been born in the Warren Harding administration, which was long ago enough I'd forgotten there was a Warren Harding administration. Okay? Uh, it was really good for young people to see elders acting the way that we need elders to act in a working society. And so if I have any message to y'all, it's use the things that you have close to hand to figure out how to inflict as much leverage as you possibly can. Don't settle for doing the things that are, you know, uh, easy and immediately around you to do. I mean, it's very good to do those things, but don't limit yourself to them. Find the places where there is leverage to be had because that's what it's going to take. We are behind in this fight. We are losing this fight at the moment. That's what it means that the temperature keeps going up and up and up. So what we need to do is find the places where we can make not a difference, but a big difference in a short time. And if we can do that, then we've got a chance, you know, at a world where people get to keep um, skiing for a long time to come, which is the kind of world we want. So thank you all very much.